morning, guys. Again, we, we finish Jonah this, this weekend, and, uh, but, but I guarantee God is not finished in, in teaching us this lesson, this important lesson of, of God's deep mercy in the midst of, of discipline. I mean, discipline. God uses some unique discipline to reach the heart of Jonah, sending a whale to, cap, to capture him, but ultimately to recapture his heart. And then in, in our chapter today, we're going to see him not send a whale, but a worm this time to eat the shelter, the leafy plant that, uh, yeah, we're going to get to that. But, but anyways, we, we're, we might be done with this, this series, but God's not done in, in shaping and reshaping in, uh, uh, our hearts through, through, through God's loving discipline. Uh, Jonah's a story where we see, again, God's discipline do some, some funky stuff. Uh, and as I was preaching this, this sermon in the, the Benton County Jail, one of the guys chimes out. He, he says, hey, I got I to gotta say something. Our whale is this jail. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. He's like, yeah, we've been captured. We're here, but we're protected. And in, in the same way, the whale was a protection um, from the elements, and, and some of them are, are thankful for being captured because so, they're trying to get off of drugs and get out of gang life and stuff. I thought that was really interesting. So you can remember that. Our, our, our whale is this jail. And so I want you to hang on to that, that sometimes maybe you're captured in a season of discipline, and it's hard, and, and you're, you're just like, man, I'm frustrated. This is uncomfortable. Uh, Jonah literally describes like seaweed wrapped around his head. And uh, just, I mean, it's, it's grotesque being, I, I can't imagine, being in the, the belly of a fish, and yet he finds God's deep mercy in the midst of this deep discipline. And, and, and it's amazing, God, at, at, you know, zooming out, we see, okay, God's going after the heart of the city. God's going after to, to save the city, but he's really also going after uh, the preacher, the preacher who isn't saved yet in a sense. He, he's, he's captured uh, by his own bitterness and needs recapturing through Discipline. So I want you to write this down. We need correction so we can have God's affection. We can experience God's uh, affection. I'll say it again. We need correction so we can experience God's affection. Have you, have you ever been asked by God to, to go or prompted by God to go and have coffee or lunch with someone that you don't care for very much? Think about that for a second. You're just like, oh, man, God, are you serious? I need to go do this. And then you're obedient to do it, and then you just hate them more. You're like, what's going on? I thought, that I'm, I'm obeying you, God. This is not working. I'm just, I dislike them more. What's going on? Uh, this is, I mean, Jonah is reluctant. I mean, he, he comes out of the, the fish, uh, out of this place of discipline, and he's and out of duty, not delight. Write that down. We do things out of duty, not delight. Sometimes he's just like, okay, fine, I'll go do this. But he's still prejudiced. He's still hanging on to bitterness. And, and it's not good. It's not good. So again, how does Jonah's anger and bitterness and prejudice help a church, help us, that our vision is be in the city for the city? <laughs> how does it help us? Sometimes being in the city for the city, we, we see the muck. We, we roll up our sleeves and we see the muck around us, but we also see the muck in our own heart, the prejudice in our own heart. Think about this. How does his, his poutiness toward God when God forgives Nineveh because they repent, how does this help us? Again, it's discovering God's deep mercy for these, these people in this story of Jonah, that it, it not only helps us, but heals our own, our own prejudice, our own bitterness and unforgiveness. And it helps us receive God's discipline as God is disciplining us instead of rejecting him, instead of rebelling against him, all of a sudden we're like, man, you know what? There is, there is brokenness. There is a lack of love and forgiveness for others. I need your discipline, God. I'm going to take this. I'm going to receive this discipline because in this, this, this discipline, I, I'm able to experience this correction. I'm experiencing your affection. This is a good thing. When we see ourselves in Jonah, when we really get honest and begin to see ourselves in Jonah, we will we'll begin to see our need for Jesus. Many of you have showed up this morning out of duty and not delight. 
And when, when God begins to discipline you and correct you and people are like, hey, let's, I want to, di- let's do some discipleship, which discipleship's a form of the word discipline. We get that, that word from that. We, we don't like that. We want to just be a spectator. We want to come and out of duty, dress up and show up for service and not get, not roll up our sleeves and go, let's get disciplined, um, for, 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 to, to, and let's get corrected for, for God's affection. We, we need that. We need reoriented. We need restructured. We need redirected. And we need God's, God's discipline to recapture our hearts so we can love the unlovable. And our relationship with God is a, an example of that. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Well, let's read our passage, guys. And, and again, we're going to look for, we're going to see this reluctant, grumpy missionary And we're going to see ourselves at times. So so let's look at this. We're finishing. This is part two of of chapter four and starting at verse five. Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the, the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. So he wants bombs to go off. He wants fire and sulfur to go off and consume these people he doesn't like. And instead... Uh, the Lord God arranges for a leafy plant to grow there. And, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged, we're going to see the word arranged over and over again, arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged. See, God, God's a planner. God's arranging for a scorch, that's, that's part of God's discipline. He's disciplining. It's a setup for a, look at this, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. Do we know about uh, scorching east winds here in the Tri-Cities? Do we know about it? Okay. Dust devils? <laughs> Where do you think he got that name? All right. So the sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he explained. It's probably from Seattle. Uh, then, then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. So so he's telling God, yeah, yeah, I want to die. God even is like, are you sure? (laughs) Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant. I need you listening. Please listen. Please listen. Here's the lesson. Here's the lesson in all the discipline. There's discipline, discipline, discipline. We get ticked off and pouty when God disciplines and corrects us. Here's the, so we see correction. Here's the affection right here. Here's the affection. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. Again, it's not a whale this time. It's a worm that eats the plant. Verse 11, but Nineveh has... F- has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. He's basically saying, you want me to feel sorry for you, Jonah? How about the 120,000 people? Like, you're, you're worried about the, the hot sun? What about hell that's much hotter? 120,000. We're on Facebook Live right now, and people are, like, commenting probably, what, hell? You're not allowed to talk about hell. But look at this. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? That's the sermon. That's the word of the Lord. Again, in our story, God goes after Jonah by disciplining him in order to save him. If you're taking notes, write that down. Disciplining him in order to save him. Playing, playing sports, I had some coaches that just yelled at me. They're just angry and mad, and they just yelled. Some coaches that yelled at me, but it was out of love. It was out of love, and they, that correction was meant for, I mean, there was affection behind the correction. Sometimes there's this correction, and it's a, it comes from a ticked-off, mean, mean spirit. This is not the God that has wonderfully and perfectly created us. He, that is not the God uh, that, that he's not coming to, to do this, and he's not mean-spirited about it. He has affection behind the correction. Uh, again, in, in the story of God, God goes after Jonah by disciplining him in order to save him. And in the same sense, he's doing that with you in your own life. Look at your circumstances. Look at the whale that, that has you right now. I don't know what it is, I'm, and then, but God does, and you do. Get honest with God. 
So again, the city is saved, but the preacher is not. I'll say it again. The city is saved, but the preacher is not. How ironic. Jonah reluctantly obeyed God, but out of duty instead of delight. So why does God want us to stop sinning? Isn't that just a great question up there? Number two, why does God discipline us when we sin? So many people misunderstand God. They think he's some cosmic killjoy that just wants to rain on your parade. He just doesn't want you to have any fun. Choosing Jesus means no more fun. When, what, what was, was Jesus' first miracle? It was, at a, it was at a party. It was a, a wedding celebration. And he turned uh, water into wine. Now, to be clear... <laughs> To be very clear, God says, obey the laws of the land. So all you like 18 year olds that are like, woo, pastor said, here we go. (laughs) Obey the laws of the land. Be be wise. Jesus is not endorsing alcoholism. Jesus is not endorsing drunkenness. Just in the same way God created sex, uh, but, but the perversion of that is like prostitution and pornography. In no way is he endorsing any of these terrible abuses uh, and, and so, but, but again, m- many people think, oh, God is this cosmic killjoy and he wants to kill fun. And the devil's fun. The devil, well, sin is fun for a season. We, we do know that. But you need to understand something very clear. Hear me, cl- hear God clearly here. Is the, the devil is a perverter. That is all he is. He is not a creator. He's a perverter. And so when God disciplines us, it's not to rain on our, and not to, not to kill our fun so that we can actually enjoy, enjoy things a lot better, enjoy things a lot better. People using meth and getting, and just, and they, they have this party and orgies and this and that, and then they don't, they got STDs and they don't remember what happens the next day. And the, the guy that enjoys a glass of wine with his wife and that, I'm going to move on. But anyways, it's, it's way better. It's way better than, the, than sin's way. I'm being a little blunt there, but I want to be honest. God wants to, to us to avoid sin so we can better enjoy Him and His everlasting love while simultaneously loving the unlovable. Here's what's, here's what's crazy. Those people, whoever your Nineveh is, need discipline too. They need correction too. Because they're not experiencing affection. You're not experiencing their affection. They're, un- they're, they're unliking you or unfollowing you or, or dissing you or shunning you or whatever. Talking about you, gossiping about you. But remember, they're missing out on God's affection. How can they love you when they haven't experienced God's love? So remember that. Remember that. That will give you a love for the unlovable. Yesterday, we had a, a, a yard sale here at the church for the, the missionary team going to Haiti. And I was like, man, you know, I, sh- I should bring pizza to the, to the crew. So I called them up and said, hey, can I bring you guys some pizza? So I called a pizza place in town. I'm not going to say the name of the pizza place. But immediately, it was right to, right to business. And I was like, hey, how you doing today? Nothing on the other. It's just like, what can I get you? It's just takeout or pickup, you know, or what, what do you, or delivery, you know. I was like, you don't talk to me like that. I wanted to. I'm just trying to be nice. I'm trying to be nice. Then I, I show up to this pizza, pizza establishment, and I, get, I don't have my wife with me. She's doing other stuff. So it's just me, and I got the two littles with me, five-year-old, two-year-old, pizza boxes, babies in hand. You know, like, so I'm like, oh, man, I, you know, okay, unpack them. We all come in. I got my daughter and my son. We're walking in. The lady looks at me, she smiles, and I'm thinking, oh, she's going to say hi to the kids or something. No, no affection. Just, um, are you, uh, and just gets right to, the, right to business. Here we go. And I'm like, Bible verse in my head is, faithful are the wounds of a friend. I need to be honest with her. I need to help her with customer service. <laughs> Let's help her out. Now, how many of you think, think that I talked to her about that and I corrected her? Raise your hand. Oh, I almost did. The Holy Spirit put me in a half Nelson. <laughs> did not do it. Wouldn't be prudent. 
No, I didn't, I didn't do it, guys. Um, but what I, it's crazy. I was just like, Holy Spirit, help me. What am I supposed to do? I just feel. And then I see her, but she's like texting. And, and I'm just like, she could be talking to the kids or something. No, no, one's, no one's at the restaurant. Like, I, I, we're, I got there like at 11. No one was there. And on my way out, just the simplest thing, I was just like, kids, say, 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 uh, say goodbye to the nice lady. And she, it stopped her. She looked over. She smiled. She's like, have a good day. And something hit me. Sometimes the correction God needs with is a demonstration of affection. That we yeah. would just demonstrate it. Doesn't that give you, I mean, just give me chills just thinking about that. That was the Holy Spirit. Just, and I did not want to do it. I was just like, uh-huh, not coming back here. <laughs> no. But it was neat to see her smile. Instead of just like, I need to correct you. I need to fix you. I need, sometimes a demonstration of God's affection will, will, will bring truly correction. So again, in our story of Jonah, we, we see the first need, the first need uh, of discipline is because Jonah prefers his shelter over God's shelter. We can see this on the, on the screen here. Jonah prefers his shelter over God's shelter. Psalm 46 and verse 1 is so helpful. It's a great reminder of God's shelter. It says, God is our shelter and strength, always ready to help us in times of trouble. And yet this pouty prophet, that's right, this pouty prophet goes and sulks in the corner to build his own shelter. I've never done that. I'm never a pouty pastor, ever, ever, ever. No, I am. So he goes to the corner, and, and, and actually, practically, he goes to the corner of the city, which is pretty practical, and maybe he's doing it for safety purposes, just in case God changes his mind and, and would bring... Uh, bring destruction on them. So he's, he's like getting at a safe distance, but he's also sulking in the corner. Look at it, verse five. Then Jonah went out to the east, east side of the city and made a shelter. He made a shelter. Interesting. You're like, well, wait a minute. I thought, uh, I thought this leafy plant is gonna grow. I'm tripping. What you, what's going on? He's, he, makes a, he makes his own shelter, sulking, pouting, pouty prophet in the corner. And then God grows another shelter, and he's very pleased. Okay, we'll get to that. Let's back up. We as a church family, we can see right out of the gate why, why Jonah needs discipline. Ooh, Jonah needs some discipline. The pizza lady, she needs some discipline. Man, my kids need some discipline. Right? Do we do that? I love the Oregon Coast in fact, just, just got back uh, a bit ago, a week ago, um, got to bury my daughter in the sand. My eight-year-old was just like, it's exfoliating. It's so sweet. You know, but, but anyways, I just bury her, not all the way in the sand, okay, but it, just her head sticking out. It was a lot of fun. And then built a couple sand, <laughs> just to be very clear, um, and, then, and then built some sand castles with the kids and just, just had so much fun. It reminded me of a, of a, a vision I believe God gave me in my mind's eye a couple years ago. And it was a, a vision of discipline. In this vision, I, I, I saw my kids building this sandcastle, and I'm trying to talk to my kids about this, this sandcastle, this shelter, if you will, that they're building. And they won't talk to me. They won't look at me in this vision. And it was frustrating me. They were more consumed. They had more affection for this shelter, this, this sandcastle they're building, right? In the vision, the children become me. And in the vision, the father calling to, to the children becomes Christ. And Christ is calling to me. And the sandcastle was this church. And he was saying, fix your eyes on me. Stop trying to grow the, the church. Healthy things will grow. And the healthy thing to do is to look at me and, to, and the affection. But sometimes we need discipline. Sometimes we, think we need things to get a little rocky. We need the boat to get rocked, sometimes tipped over, sometimes obliterated, to shake us up, to, to correct us, to point us, to discipline us to God's great affection and great love. See, in this vision, I was looking at the success, and I've, you've heard me say this before, the success of the church being my shelter. You tracking with me? That was my shelter. What is it for you? 
What is it, uh, what is it for you? The success, if you're a kid, the, the, uh, you're a student, the success in class, the, the success you have in a sport, the success of your marriage, the success, uh, whatever it is, fill it in. There's, don't be short-sighted with the, with the false security of a shelter that comes and goes, but focus on Christ. Jonah was, was short-sighted. He was, he was focused on his own comfort and own shelter. We, like sheep, have gone astray. We need help moving our eyes from our own shelter, our own comfort, to Christ as the great comfort, the great shelter. Number two, God arranges for shelter. God arranges for another shelter. It's a, it's a better shelter. We don't know what the first one looked like exactly, but this pouty prophet who builds a shelter, it's not very good. And so God builds, or God, God grows a shelter, but it's for a setup. Sometimes success is a setup. I remember this old pastor getting up. Uh, it was in Seattle uh, in 2013. He gets up and he goes, pastors, beware of success. Then he just stared at us. He's like, had this frown on his face. I was like, wow, what is going on? Like, like success doesn't, sometimes success is a setup to teach you, to grow you. Look at Jonah 4 and verse 6, and the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Grab a bottle of liquor, drink the whole thing, and you might get some comfort from your pain and bad dreams and, and the, the lack of sleep that you've been getting and grab the bottle for comfort and it will give you comfort, but it will also give you a very rough morning. <laughs> so there's things that can, pornography, it, it, will, it will make your heart race, it will get you excited and it will give you temporary comfort, but it is a false shelter that will bring devastation and wreak horrible horrible havoc on not only you, but your future marriages or your current marriage. It'd be devastating. By the way, God never gives you sin. By the way, God, don't, don't go, oh, this whatever is, God gave me this bottle of liquor or God gave me, uh, don't, don't ever do that. This, don't, don't go, okay, well, from Jonah, we can get that. Here, God is arranging a shelter. God gives him, God gives him a shelter, but it's for a setup. Sometimes we set ourselves up is my point. Sometimes we just, we hurt ourselves. Notice in this, in verse six, it says he's very grateful. He's very grateful, not to God for the plant though, for the plant. He's like, yes, he's very grateful. It's the first time this grumpy, racist, world's worst missionary uh, is finally happy. <laughs> and it's over a plant. It's over a plant. It's short-sighted. I want to say this again. Psalm 91, Psalm 91 and verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Jonah loved this shelter because it provided a shadow, a shadow. This world can produce some shadows. This world can give you some shadows to hide under. It's only the shadow of the Almighty that we find the shelter of the Lord. Amen. Do you agree? Do you agree? It's a very quiet today, quiet bunch. In the next few verses, we will see what God gives and God takes away. I'm going to say it again. God gives and he takes away. God takes away this leafy shelter by sending not a whale, but he sends a worm this time to eat the plant. And in the book of Job, not Jonah, the book of Job, we learn something about God and his character. Look at this. And he said, naked, or this is Jonah, or excuse me, Job talking. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. But watch what he says. Watch what he says. Watch what he says. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Is your weapon in this world that's difficult, is it worship or is it whining? And you're like, oh, here Josh goes again. <laughs> he always says this, but then why do I keep saying it? Because we keep whining. It's not our, it's not our natural bent to, to, to worship. 
Job has the right heart to praise God in the good and the bad. Jonah does not. Job has the right heart in the good and the bad. God gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jonah is not there. Jonah's heart isn't quite there yet. He needs a whole lot of work. He needs he needed the whale. He needed the whale to discipline him. And now he needs this little itty bitty worm to do some damage to, to correct him. Praise God that God doesn't destroy us. He disciplines us. I'll say it again. Praise God that God doesn't destroy us. He disciplines us. His correction shows his affection for us. I'll read this again. See, God gives Jonah shelter, but then takes it away and then gives him discomfort to help Jonah discover that Nineveh without God's sheltering will suffer eternal discomfort. This is a big deal. Think about that. And we know a foreshadowing that just as Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days, Jesus, the better Jonah, the better prophet, the, the better priest, the better he's the better everything, the better king. He's the king of kings. He's the God-man, deity that's taken on humanity. He comes and, and conquers sin and death, and he comes out of the belly, not of a fish, but out of a grave after three days. This is huge. So it's a foreshadowing. It's saying ultimately this would be the shelter right here. Without the shelter, without the faith and the Messiah that would come, without that, Nineveh's going to perish. You're going to perish. Everyone's going to perish. without if Because there's a, there's a flood of wrath coming, but this time it's not going to be Noah's ark that we need to save us. We need the, the lumber, not for a boat, but the ark of our salvation is the cross of Christ that shelters us. But we need correction to see that affection, to see what the cross actually means and what the blood actually means. The world around us sees this as an aroma of death and sees us when we take communion as like cannibals. Why would you drink blood? What a messed up religion. You guys are wackos and weirdos. But it it says in Scripture that, that to those that are perishing, we are fools to them and we are an aroma of death to them to those that that have trusted in him and are are letting God correct us it's an aroma of life which is good so he's complaining he's complaining that his little umbrella his umbrella is, is no more and God is essentially saying, how much worse is it for the entire city to burn? You got a little sunburn on your bald head? You got a little sunburn? How much more of a burn will, will, will these 120,000 people feel if I pull back my, my, my covering over them? Yeah. Hebrews 12 and verse 6 says this, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son in whom he receives. In fact, if you want to turn to Hebrews, this is so good. I'm going to read a little bit more on this. Verse 5 sets it up. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as children? He said, my child, don't make light. Don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as a child. I'm going to keep reading. As you endure, someone say endure. As you endure, and I'm going to tell you just a little secret. It's the Holy Spirit and the gospel that gives us eternal life that helps us endure, helps us endure. But as you endure endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who, who is never disciplined by its father, if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly Fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we? I'm almost done. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? You can live in the season your own, the, the season that you're in. You can enjoy the, the, the sin that's fun for a season, but it is fleeting. It is only temporary. I'd rather enjoy eternal life. So again, God disciplines us to capture, capture our hearts and cultivate us to right thinking. 
How is God disciplining you currently? This is a question you can see it on the screen. How is God disciplining you currently in a way that displays his deep mercy? Are you rebelling or receiving this correction? Are you seeing God's affection behind this correction? Many of us, we come into church like pigs coming to a trough. And, and, we, and, and we need correction on that. We, 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 we come in, we don't think about people around us. We got an agenda. We come for our reason instead of coming to love others. And sometimes it's a simple hug from, from maybe a special needs child that just comes up and hugs you or high fives you at a worship gathering and stops you in your tracks from being like a pig that just comes to the trough and forgets about everyone around you. Start loving the people around you, friends. Start serving. Don't, don't just go, well, I don't have any kids at church here, so good luck with your children's ministry. And, and uh, coffee, you know, I don't like coffee, so I'm not going to help with that. And, and uh, jail ministry, Josh and you guys, and you, Corey and Nate, you guys have fun. That's not my thing. And gospel community, I don't like people very much, so I'm not going to I got to step foot in someone's living room. I don't even know. And so, plus, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to come for the sermon. That's all I need. Did Jesus say, hey, just, just come listen to me preach? Is that what he said? Or did he say, come follow me? Yeah, we need correction. We need correction from the materialism, from, from just the way of doing church, thinking we're just going to show up and, and, and we're okay. And, and we think God's okay with us hating the person across the aisle. Or on the other side, or uh, of the of the church building, or on the and we, we or, or hating our neighbor. God wants to correct us. God wants to grow us. But 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 look at me for a second. It's going to be uncomfortable. It is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Colossians four and verse six says this: Let your speech. Always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Do you think this happens overnight? <laughs> like you wake up and you're like, man, honey, you're fantastic. I mean, this is amazing. I mean, the night before, you were a brat, but today, <laughs> wow, thank you. You're terrific. Must have been Josh's sermon. It just changed everything. Mm. Can't wait for next week when we do that again. Let's do that church thing. Let's get our church on. Yeah. It doesn't happen overnight. We need to receive God's correction and rely on God. Now watch this. God to discipline us. I'm going to say this though, but also God's community. Yes. No, I don't trust people. I just trust God. This is not an individual sport. Sorry. Cross country is really cool, or golf is neat. This is not golf, okay? This is more like football. This is a team sport. How good can you be at football if it's just a one-person sport? You could be the best quarterback in the world. If you don't have a line working with you, if you don't have someone catching, it's a team sport, and we have to help, help each other, and we have to believe that the Holy Spirit is in this church, and, and we gotta let it disciple us and sharpen us. We need community, friends. We need each other. And that's hard because sometimes I'm the pouty prophet, that, the pouty pastor that's tired of people hurting me. So I do this. I can't, I can't do that. Proverbs 15 and verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath. I was working with a couple and I, and I said, hey, have you, have you thought about this verse? A soft answer turns away wrath. And they were like, No, no, we need this. But we will not be soft and tender if we are rejecting God's correction. First Thessalonians 5.14, brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Warn those, warn them. Well, no, we can't offend, we can't offend. Come on, we're in 2018, they will unfriend you. We can't do that. We need to urge we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those. So don't just have a rhetoric that's warning and tough, but also balance it with the tenderness. So don't just warn. It says also encourage those who are timid. Take tender. Someone say tender. 
tender care of those who are weak, like the pizza lady. I'm not going to go, hey, hello. Let me, let me talk to you about customer service, young lady. Let me help you out. Sometimes it's a demonstration of God's affection that will bring ultimately correction. Religion corrects. Correct, correct. Stop it. Stop drinking. Stop having fun. Just stop everything. Religion's like, don't have fun. Stop it. The gospel, it says, we've been accepted because of God. Let's enjoy God. It says in scripture, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's actually okay to enjoy God. It's amazing. We're called to do it. God is most glorified when we're satisfied in him. And, but not, it doesn't stop there, but also to bring him glory. It brings glory to him to see his people not soaking and pouting, but worshiping and receiving, receiving the correction of the Lord. As the worship team joins us, I, I'm almost done here. Luke 7 and verse 47. This one always is hard to read for me. It's, it's difficult to read this. Therefore, this is, this is about the woman that was caught in adultery and they're ready to stone her. And Jesus says, you without sin cast the first stone. And he says, therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little, little. Nineveh was quick to repent and rejoice because they knew they had been forgiven much. Do you realize that you've been forgiven much? You'll receive correction. You'll receive it. You won't rebel anymore. You won't reject it anymore. You'll receive it. And you say, Lord, help, help me to be disciplined, to pray for my teachers, to pray for my parents, to pray. Or if you're a parent, pray for your kids, to pray for your spouse. Maybe your spouse right now is driving you nuts. Pray for them. Maybe they're your Nineveh. But Jonah, Jonah see, Jonah didn't see his sin. He was paying attention to the, the speck of sawdust in someone else's while all along he had a two by four sticking out of his eye, right? He could only see God. He could only see Nineveh's sin. This is why we need Matthew 3 and verse 8. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Many times it's, it's being disciplined to go, okay, Lord, I'm going to step out of the boat. I'm going to love this person that's really difficult to love. God, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to watch my mouth and I'm going to really be silent when I want to talk and I'm going to really listen to you and, okay, I'm going to be disciplined. And then you see God meet you on the battlefield. God meet you when you are disciplined to be obedient. But listen, listen, listen. Please don't ever think that your obedience is, is like, like, like you patting yourself on the back like, it was me. <laughs> I was good. I was good. That's why God met me on the battlefield. Don't, don't ever take confidence in your obedience. It's God at work in you, wooing you and drawing you to Him. Right. In fact, if you have a good attitude all in the midst of discipline, give credit to, to God. Yes. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's him at work. Otherwise, you'll become legalistic and performance-centered. It's, it's a dangerous place to be. Jonah 4, 10 through 11, uh, the, just the last part again, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for this city, this great city? Jonah wanted it. God to focus. Hey, why'd you take my shelter? What are you doing? I'm getting a sunburn. Why'd you do this? All of Jonah's trials were a discipline of God to show him that not only Nineveh needed new life, but Jonah needed new life. So here's our main takeaway. Since God's discipline, since God disciplines those he loves, let us not resist or rebel, but rather receive his correction for the reward of eternal life. See, that correction, receiving correction, will help us experience his affection. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you.